Uh, I'm Esteban Pinto, and today I will talk about uh, my personal project uh, named Above Ground Biomass Productivity Species Richness Patterns uh, Along an Altitudinal Gradient in the Ecuadorian Andean Forest. Um, the tropical Andes uh, constitute the longest and widest cool tropic, uh, region in the tropics. Uh, they extend uh, without interruptions uh, from the north in Venezuela to the south in Bolivia. And an important part of the tropical Andes landscape are the tropical Andean mountain forest. Um, these ecosystems uh, play a key role in the provision of ecosystem services. Uh, they can act as water and climate uh, regulators. And as climate regulators, they they, uh, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and fix it in the structure of the forest. Actually, they can store more than 200 tons of carbon per hectare of forest just in the biomass and more than 300 tons of carbon in the soil of this forest. Um, these ecosystems uh, top the, loss, uh, the list of worldwide hotspots for endemism and number of species area ratio. And that's because they are rich in species and life forms. Just for Ecuador, uh, between 30 and 35,000 uh, species of vascular plants and more than 1,700 species of birds uh, have been described. And between the 50 and 60% of all of those uh, species are exclusive for the Andean region. Also, um, the tropical Andean mountain forest shows a rapid species turnover with elevation, and this is probably uh, the main responsible for this high uh, diversity. Also, uh, here in these ecosystems, the above ground biomass and productivity are subject to different uh, stru structuring mechanisms and ecological processes. Uh, for example, the elevation and the species richness influence the above ground biomass variation in mountain uh, ecosystems. And according to the literature, what we know until now is that both species richness and above ground biomass increase, increase when the elevation uh, decreases and both can get their lowest uh, values when the elevation increases. Uh, in Ecuador, for example, we have uh, several uh, forests in different successional stages and with marked uh, environmental uh, gradient gradients uh, because of the mountains, and probably these patterns can be different. And this um, associated with a loss of biodiversity as a combined effect, a combined result of climate change and different land use practices like logging, like cattle, have made the tropical um, mountain and then forest a vulnerable area and priority scenarios for research and conservation. Here, uh, the biodiversity patterns and species composition uh, have been compromised, and how all these changes are affecting the functionality and the dynamics in these ecosystems is unclear. Uh, and that's why uh, I want to evaluate the above ground biomass a variation along an elevation gradient in the tropical Andean mountain forest. And uh, my hypothesis here is that an increase in elevation leads to a decrease in the above ground biomass stocks. Additionally, um, I want to understand the relationship between uh, abiotic and abiotic factors, and additionally, the human disturbances effect uh, in the spatial variation uh, of above ground biomass in this ecosystem. Uh, here, my second hypothesis is that uh, the environmental factors and the past human disturbances can control the spatial variations in biomass. Uh, the, this study uh, was carried out in a monitoring system established in 2015 in Ecuador in Pichincha province. Uh, this uh, system covered an elevation gradient, an, an altitudinal gradient of approximately 3,000 uh, meters uh, from 600 to 3,500 meters above sea level. Along the gradient, we are evaluating uh, four different types of mountain forest, and we have established a diff, uh, 17 uh, plots. 
uh, we are using square plots of 60 by 60. And inside the plots, we are evaluating the above ground biomass uh, dynamics. To do this, uh, we take measures of the diameter and total height of trees, bounds, and tree ferns with at least five centimeters of diameter at red height. Until now, we have finished uh, three census and we are evaluating uh, the dynamics in 8,000 8, trees and we have determined more than 500 species. Uh, to get our values of biomass, we are using allometric equations and we are contrasting this information with different uh, response uh, uh, predictor variables. Uh, we have uh, biotic variables and abiotic variables uh, like species richness, temperature, precipitation, slope, elevation, fragmentation, and degradation. To contrast this information, uh, we are using multiple uh, regression model, models uh, because we have a uh, one uh, response variable and we have many predictor variables. In terms of productivity, uh, this was calculated as the difference uh, between census. And we are using different um, statistical programs or softwares like SPSS, GM, uh, JMP, and R. In the section of results, in terms of biodiversity, uh, we observe that we don't have oligarchic species or the dominant of a species over the rest. Uh, this is evident in this graph uh, where we can observe that uh, approximately the 95% of the species present less than 40 individuals. And in this other graphic, this is also evident uh, because we can observe that the similarity in the species between communities is low because just some of the communities share no more than the 50% of the species between them. Additionally, uh, we observe that the richness present an inversely a proportional effect uh, with the elevation, uh, which means uh, that the richness uh, increases uh, at a lowest elevation and the richness uh, decreases when the elevation increases. In terms of biomass, um, after analyzing the formation with general linear models, I developed uh, several models, but I will continue my presentation presenting just one of them that in, for my opinion is the best because it present highly significant values and because we are using the less number of, of variables that uh, explain better the patterns in biomass that we are observing uh, throughout the gradient. We are uh, using degradation, richness and elevation. And when we plotted uh, these uh, variables with the biomass, we observe that biomass is controlled by, by elevation gradients and respond to degradation as we expected because a biomass decreases when the elevation increases and when the degradation also increases. And we can find more a biomass in when the degradation is, is, is low and at lower a, elevations always uh, also. But something that was totally unexpected is this, uh, because we observe that a uh, above ground biomass decreases when the richness increases, and we can find a uh, more biomass when we have, a, or in patches of forest, where we can find, uh, find just uh, a small number of species. In terms of productivity between 2015 and 2019, uh, we have observed uh, an annual productivity of almost uh, four uh, megagrams or four tons of biomass per hectare, or for, per hectare of forest. And in my section of discussion, um, I, I want to give you a summary of my hypothesis. The first, if you remember, was that an increase in elevation leads to a decrease in the above ground biomass stocks and that I mean, uh, this is connected with my second hypothesis uh, where uh, the environmental factors and past human disturbances can control the above, uh, above ground biomass spatial variations. And after analyzing the information, I accepted uh, the, my, my two hypotheses. 
because uh, biomass is responding to environmental and topographic factors. Uh, along the gradient, we uh, observed a mosaic of natural uh, habitats uh, that can be the responsible in part of the variations in the above ground biomass. And this spatial heterogeneity uh, in biomass along the gradient is associated to different environmental conditions like the altitude topography, the diversity, the density in the species, the nutrients in soil, and of course, to the land use history of the different forest uh, analyzed. And this, the land use history, is important uh, and play a key role in the in the above ground biomass patterns because those forests in an advanced successional stage uh, are those that present the higher values in above ground biomass stocks, and this is because more chances to find more trees with diameter over thirty centimeters, and this is the diametric class that contribute more in terms of above ground biomass. Additionally, um, after uh, our unexpected result uh, with richness, um, we, this can be because there exists a high uh, competition of species that is associated uh, with the land use history. And um, probably the species richness is not, is not the best predictor uh, for above ground biomass in these ecosystems, in these gradients. And um, probably the inclusion of new uh, metrics of diversity, like functional diversity, like phylogenetic diversity, could better approximate the processes that influence the above ground biomass uh, variations. Uh, the implications and next steps, I will start with my next steps. Um, and I mentioned before the inclusion of more, of more studies, studies are important. But first, I think that it's important to um, study we have more a in depth before the, the question portion okay. begins. Okay, uh, so I uh, think that it's important to study uh, in depth the productivity patterns along the gradient uh, that complement the information that I just presented to you. And the inclusion of new metrics of diversity uh, can help us to improve our knowledge of ecosystem and functionality. And this can provide us uh, some evidence of climate change. Um, additionally, to understand uh, the temporal and spatial dynamics, the long-term data that we are generating is important. And uh, this information is useful to identify priority scenarios for conservations, like secondary forests because of their high, highly, uh, because of their high potential to store biomass in their structures. And of course, this information is also important because we can develop, we can generate local policies that uh, where we can include adaptive uh, management of this forest and that can help us to, or contribute us uh, for the conservations of these places. So um, it's all that I have for now. Thank you very much for your time. If you have right, some questions. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Let me scroll up to get to the first one. It says, um, did you measure all organisms with a DBH of greater than five centimeters trees as well as herbaceous plants? Uh, just uh, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, I just evaluated trees, palms, and tree ferns. Uh, no more than that. Okay, and the next question is, how is important is the biodiversity to the absorption of the carbon? Uh, of course, uh, we know that biodiversity, um, there exists a, a, a strong relationship between uh, diversity and, and carbon, uh, and carbon storage, right? So we assume that uh, uh, places with a high diversity will be able to store more carbon. So it's important to conserve these ecosystems with high uh, diversity because they can help us to fight against the global warming in a better way. Uh, we have the opportunity to store more carbon that won't be uh, uh, like that won't be in the in the in the atmosphere, of course, and we will be able to store these. 
this carbon in the structure of the forest and not in, in, the, in the atmosphere, you know? Okay, um, and the next question is, um, says you mentioned land, past land uses, human disturbances in your second hypothesis. So what are the characteristic land uses past or present of your study sites? Okay, uh, the, the characteristics uh, mainly are um, associated to, to the conditions of the soil. We are evaluating the conditions of the soil and we used uh, we used uh, some scenarios uh, uh, highly degraded. We evaluated the, the soil conditions and we contrast the soil conditions with the uh, with the current scenarios where we are um, evaluating the carbon stocks. So they are really totally different in terms of nutrients organic matters and the uh, total amount of carbon that you can store in these soils. Uh, and of course, these characteristics um, play a key role in the accumulation of carbon in the, in the biomass of the forest, because the, the forests are responding to these different conditions. And of course, so the soils in better conditions will be able to store uh, more biomass, and more carbon in the soil, and they will present more biodiversity also. So they are basically the, the main differences between degraded and not degraded uh, areas, or past and present areas. Okay, if there's no more questions, we can go ahead and transition to the final presenter of the evening. We have uh, Gwyneth Dalton doing a presentation on the impacts of pH on larval salamander competition. So if you want to go ahead and begin sharing your screen and getting set up. And you can begin whenever you're ready. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Gwyneth Dalton and I will be talking about the impacts of pH on larval salamander competition. Both, both abiotic and biotic factors play a role in community structure. In order to properly manage species, one must understand the habitats in which they reside in. Temperature over the last 30 years has been shifting by increasing, causing fall breeding amphibians such as marbled and dwarf salamanders to mate later in the season and spring breeding amphibians such as tiger salamanders and the ornate horse frog to breed earlier. Temperature has also shifted the range of 63% of 35 non-migratory European butterflies into northern cooler climates when only 3% of these species have shifted south. Our oceans have also increased in temperature causing coral bleaching, which then um, the coral is impacted by the increasing acidity in our oceans due to their calcium carbonate skeletons disintegrating due to the carbonic acid in the water. Unfortunately, there's already evidence that freshwater bodies are becoming more acidic as well in the same way that our oceans are. Biotic factors also have a large impact on community structure. In the presence of predators, gray tree frogs will shift their tails from a brown color to a bright orange and black. Competitive interactions also play a role in community structures since larval salamanders will leave vernal pools sooner with a lower body mass due to high competitive interactions, even though having a higher body mass at metamorphosis, metamorphosis is advantageous since food sources can be limited on land. Larval salamanders live in vernal pools which have very short hydro periods. These pools fill with rainwater in early spring and then dry up in midsummer. The animals in these ecosystems are balancing the risk of desiccation to the probability of predation from larger salamanders or um, 
larval dragonflies. Fortunately, due to the short hydro period, these pools don't have any fish in them, which would have eaten the salamander larvae and also amphibian eggs. Some vernal pools, though, are more acidic than others, depending on what forest type they're located in. In Georgia, vernal pools in longleaf pine ecosystems are more acidic than the vernal pools in hardwood forests. Unfortunately, just like freshwater bodies such as lakes and streams are becoming more acidic um, as the climate changes. Um, so there might be evidence that vernal pools are also becoming more acidic as well. Larval salamanders are the apex predator in vernal pool ecosystems in addition to larval dragonflies. They are known for eating almost anything that is smaller than their mouth and their diet mainly consists of zooplankton, insect larvae, tadpoles, and other smaller salamanders. Just like their adult form, larval salamanders have permeable skin that can absorb toxins and so they are very susceptible to herbicides, pesticides, and shifts in pH, making them a prime bioindicator of ecosystem health. In the state of Georgia, there are species of salamander larvae that are more tolerant to pH than others. Marbled salamanders, or Avistoma opacum, is present in most of Georgia, but especially in the Piedmont area. These, these species prefer vernal pools that are trending towards neutral as they prefer pools that are 5.5 to 7.5 in pH. Marble salamanders are also known for being very aggressive and even cannibalistic at times. They lay their eggs in late fall to early winter and the female protects the eggs until, and keeps them moist until they hatch when the vernal pool fills with water. Tiger salamanders or Abysoma maculatum, <laughs> Abysoma tigregrum, um, have a large range across the continental United States and parts of Canada. The subspecies that is in Georgia is Abysoma tigregum tigregum, which is the um, light purple in the map in the bottom left. These salamanders, unlike most salamander larvae, are capable of residing in pH as low as 4.5, but prefer a vernal pool um, in the range of 5 to 6 pH. In Georgia, these salamanders are, are known to live in, in coastal plains, which is more acidic and only have a small overlap in range with marble salamanders. These salamanders breed in the spring once vernal pools are filled with water. Um, you can see the salamander range in the range map over there to the right. Um, the marble salamanders are the dark green in the top of the state of Georgia. The overlap in range between the marbled and the tiger salamanders is in the blue, and yellow is only tiger salamanders. The dots within the county show documented records of species presence. My hypotheses are that aggression by tiger salamanders will be inversely related to pH, as well as the survivorship will increase with increasing pH faster for marble salamanders compared to tiger salamanders in that a low pH mat, at low pH mass and survivorship will be lower for marbled salamanders when they occur with tiger salamanders compared to marbles alone. And lastly, at a high pH tiger salamander mass and survivorship will be lower when they occur with marbled salamanders than when they are alone at a lower pH. Using a regression design, I will have 42 di different mesocosms, and within the 42 mesocosms, I will have seven different pHs. Each pH will have three different densities, which are shown in the graph in the upper right-hand corner of my slide, and each density will have two replicates. The pH levels that I will have my mesocosms at are 4.5, 5, 5.5, 6.7, 6.5, 7 and 7.5. The tanks with only one species in them will account for intraspecific competition and the impact of pH on just one species, while the mesocosm with both species in them accounts for the impact of pH on interspecific competition. In total, I will have 252 larval salamanders of each species with a total of 504 larval salamanders. Each mesocosm is 
400 liters and they will be filled up with 300 liters of well water when the bottoms are going to be filled with hardwood leaf litter to mimic vernal pools. Each mesocosm will be inoculated with zooplankton and phytoplankton from a local pond and then supplemented with daphnia to feed the larval salamanders. These mesocosms will be placed under a pavilion to reduce the shift in pH due to rainwater and the pH will be shifted using sulfuric acid. Marble salamander eggs will be collected in late fall and brought back to the lab where they will be stored in Tupperware containers. Um, a piece of paper towel will be placed over the eggs to keep them moist. Tiger salamander eggs will be collected then in the spring when they are laid. I'll be collecting over 400 eggs of each species to account for rot and for cannibalistic behavior since larval salamanders will eat eggs of their same species. These eggs will be kept in tanks until they start hatching and then the larval salamanders will be moved to a different tank until there are enough larval salamanders to fill the mesocosm. Each salamander larvae will be weighed and measured when added to the mesocosm. They will also be weighed again halfway through the experiment and then once more when they metamorphose. Tail, tail loss will be observed halfway through the experiment when they are measured for the second time, and each mesocosm will be observed for one minute for competitive interactions such as tail biting or chasing. This will happen six times throughout the experiment. This experiment will last either until all of the salamanders reach metamorphosis or 150 days. For my statistics, I'll be doing a regression analysis to measure interspecific competition. I will be taking the response variable, which is equal to the interaction between density and pH plus the main effects of density and pH. For intraspecific competition, the response variable is equal to the interaction between species and pH plus the main effects of species and pH. An example of this is survivorship equals marble salamanders times pH plus marble salamander plus pH. My expected results for intraspecific competition is shown in the graph to the right, where pH is, an, is on the x-axis and survivorship is on the right. Marbled salamanders are blue and tiger salamanders are the orange. This will be the same for the rest of the graphs I will show you. This expected result is that survivorship will increase with increasing pH for both mar for marble salamanders, but will have not as large an effect on tiger salamanders. The expected results for interspecific competition is that the mass of tiger salamanders will be lower at a higher pH than marble salamanders and the opposite at a lower pH, as well as tiger salamanders will have more aggressive interaction with marble salamanders at a lower pH, while marble salamanders will be more aggressive with tiger salamanders at a higher pH. Lastly, my overall expected results are that the survivorship of tiger salamanders in the presence of marble salamanders at a higher pH will be less than the survivorship of tiger salamanders at a lower pH without marbled salamanders. And the, there will be less intraspecific competition than interspecific competition. My goals for this study is to understand the optimal pH of larval salamanders and tiger salamander population in Georgia, as well as determine if pH has an effect on the outcome of com competition between tiger and marbled salamander larvae, as well as achieve a better understanding of how abiotic and biotic variables can shape salamander populations. And lastly, better to figure out how to better manage populations as pH shifts with climate change. This is especially important since tiger salamanders have just been listed as a species of concern in Georgia. Here are my citations. Are there any questions? We have a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is, how will the harvesting of eggs affect your experience?
experiment? Will this be a limiting factor in regards to finding enough eggs of each species? Um, I, I hope to find um, enough eggs um, to do my experiment. I don't think that should be that big of a problem as um, tigers marble yeah. salamanders in general lay around 100 eggs per clutch. And so technically I would only have to find around three clutches of eggs to be able to do my research. Okay, and the next question is, would the species laying eggs at different times of the year be a potential impact on the interaction? Because one group will be older and larger than the other, which seems to be a reflection of nature. Yes, so the really interesting part about that is that the, um, I can keep the eggs, um, the marble salamander eggs cooler for a longer time period. Um, and then wait until the tiger salamander eggs are about to hatch so I can keep them at the same size. Yes, that is different than what they would be like in nature, but if we're just using size as a control, um, then that is more effective since I'm just looking at the effect of pH on the interaction. But yes, um, the thing is though, if I'm not able to keep them, then it is more like in nature. But tiger salamanders also grow faster overall than marble salamanders. So it shouldn't be that big of a difference in size. So do you consider that salamanders are better bioindicators than other amphibians? And why did you choose salamanders specifically? Um, I chose salamanders specifically since um, they are the prime um, apex predator in vernal pools. And with an apex predator, if anything affects them, then it will have a cascading effect on the other amphibians that are in the vernal pool. So yes, I could have done it on frogs, but frogs don't have as large of an impact on vernal pool um, ecosystem structure than larval salamanders do. The next question is, why are vernal pools more acidic in longleaf pine ecosystems here in Georgia? Um, the acidity of the longleaf pine ecosystems is primarily due to the leaf litter that are in them. Um, pine needles on average are more acidic than um, maple or oak leaves or ash. And so that um, the leaf litter in that um, causes the acidity to change. Okay, and the next question is, do you think that climate change is a contributing factor to the acidic changes in these ecosystems? Um, yes, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this study. Um, okay. <clears throat> 